Welcome to History Uncovered, where we delve into the stories and events that have shaped our world. If you're a fan of history, be sure to hit that subscribe button below. We release new videos every day so you'll always have something new to discover. By subscribing, you'll be the first to know when our latest episodes are released, and you'll be supporting us in our mission to bring fascinating stories from the past to a wider audience. In this episode, we journey back to the tumultuous landscapes of ancient Anatolia, to the bustling ports and rugged mountains of the Kingdom of Pontus. We will be exploring the life and reign of one of its most tenacious and enigmatic rulers, a figure whose name became synonymous with resistance against the sprawling might of Rome, Mithridates VI. Mithridates, a name that resonates with tales of intrigue, rebellion, and an unparalleled mastery over poisons. A king who not only defied Rome, but also sought to carve out an empire that rivaled its grandeur. His reign, marked by relentless wars, cunning diplomacy, and a deep fascination with toxicology, has etched an unforgettable narrative in the tapestry of history. From the bustling markets of Sinope to the strategic fortresses overlooking the Black Sea, we will trace the footsteps of this formidable king, peeling back the layers of historical accounts and legends to uncover the man behind the myths. A man whose very name struck fear into the hearts of Roman generals. A man whose ambition knew no bounds. So, prepare yourself for a captivating journey into the life of Mithridates VI, the poison king of Pontus, a monarch who dared to challenge the greatest empire of his time and left a legacy that still captivates historians and enthusiasts alike. In the ancient city of Sinope, on the Black Sea coast of Anatolia, a prince with a lineage like no other was born. Mithridates Eupater Dionysus was not just any prince. His blood was a blend of Persian and Greek, tracing back to legends like Cyrus the Great, Darius the Great, and even the generals who stood by Alexander the Great. Imagine that. A lineage that's like the who's who of ancient history. Growing up in the kingdom of Pontus, Mithridates was the firstborn of Laodice the Sixth and Mithridates v. Eurygetes, who ruled from 150 to 120 BC now. His parents were no ordinary rulers either. His dad was the son of former Pontic monarchs, while his mom was a Seleucid princess, descending from monarchs like Antiochus for Epiphanes. But life took a dark turn for young Mithridates. Around 120 BC, his father was mysteriously poisoned during a grand feast in Sinope. With his father gone, the kingdom was left in the hands of his mother, Laodice VI, and her two sons. But with both Mithridates and his younger brother, Mithridates Crestus, being too young, the real power was wielded by their mother. And let's just say, she had her favorites, leaning more towards Mithridates Crestus. Sensing danger from his own family, Mithridates decided it was safer to disappear for a while. But he wasn't gone for long. Between 116 and 113 BC, he came back to Pontus, and by then, he wasn't the young prince anymore. He was a force to be reckoned with, full of energy, determination, and a knack for politics. Taking matters into his own hands, he removed his mother and brother from power, imprisoning both. His mother met her end in prison, and the fate of his brother remains a bit of a mystery. But Mithridates, ever the royal, gave them both grand funerals. In a twist that might raise a few eyebrows today, Mithridates then married his younger sister, Laodice, who was just sixteen. This wasn't just a personal decision, it was a strategic move. He aimed to keep their bloodline pure, strengthen his claim to the throne, co-rule Pontus, and ensure his heirs would have a legitimate claim in the future. Mithridates had grand visions for his state, dreaming of it as the dominant power across the Black Sea and deep into Anatolia. His ambitions first led him to Caucasus, a region to the east of the Black Sea, which today we'd recognize as part of modern-day Georgia. Before 164 BC, this was an independent kingdom, but Mithridates brought it under his control. But the Black Sea region was a complex tapestry of powers and peoples. Mithridates found himself clashing with the Scythian king Palicus for dominance over the Pontic steppe. Now, the key centers in Crimea, like the Tauric Chersonesus and the Bosporan kingdom, saw an opportunity in Mithridates. They willingly gave up their independence, banking on Mithridates' promise to shield them from the Scythians, their age-old adversaries. And Mithridates didn't disappoint. 
After a few failed attempts to invade Crimea, the Scythians and their allies, the Roxolanoi, faced heavy defeats from Mithridates' general, Diophantus. They had no choice but to accept Mithridates as their new leader. But Mithridates wasn't one to rest on his laurels. He cast his gaze towards Anatolia, where the power of Rome was steadily growing. In a strategic move, he decided to divide the regions of Paphlagonia and Galatia with King Nicomedes III of Bithynia. It's interesting to note that around the time of this invasion in 108 BC, Mithridates started using the Bithynian calendar era on his coins, probably as a nod to this alliance. This calendar had its roots with the first Bithynian king, Zippoites I, from 297 BC. However, alliances can be fickle. Mithridates soon realized that Nicomedes was leaning towards an alliance with the Romans, which was decidedly anti-Pontic. The two kings clashed over control of Cappadocia, and while Mithridates emerged victorious in their battles, Nicomedes played his Roman card. He sought help from the Roman Republic, which intervened not once, but twice on his behalf between 95 to 92 BC this left Mithridates in a tight spot. If he wanted to continue expanding his kingdom, he'd inevitably have to face the Romans. And by this point, he had made up his mind, he wanted the Romans out of Asia. Mithridates' ambitions were not limited to his own kingdom. When Nicomedes IV took the throne of Bithynia, he was essentially a puppet of the Romans. Mithridates saw an opportunity and plotted to overthrow him. But his plans were thwarted, and with Roman whispers in his ear, Nicomedes IV declared war on Pontus. The timing was fortuitous for Mithridates. Rome was embroiled in its own internal strife, the social war, leaving only two legions in all of Roman Asia. These legions, combined with Nicomedes' forces, invaded Pontus in 89 BC, but they were no match for Mithridates, who secured a decisive victory. His triumph was celebrated across Anatolia. In 88 BC, Mithridates took a drastic step. He orchestrated a mass genocide of Roman and Italian settlers in major Anatolian cities, virtually erasing the Roman footprint in the region. This event, known as the Asiatic Vespers, saw as many as 80,000 people perish. The kingdom of Pontus was a melting pot of cultures. While the royal family showcased their Greek heritage, especially in the capital city of Sinope, they also emphasized their Persian roots when the need arose. Mithridates, in particular, presented himself as a champion of Hellenism. But this might have been more about political maneuvering than genuine passion. Regardless, Greek cities, including Athens, rallied behind him, and his fleet even laid siege to the Romans in Rhodes. Further strengthening his position, Mithridates formed an alliance with the king of Armenia, Tigranes the Great, who married Mithridates' daughter, Cleopatra of Pontus. Rome, however, was not about to let the massacre of 88 BC go unanswered. They launched a massive invasion, marking the beginning of the First Mithridatic War. The Roman general, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, managed to push Mithridates out of Greece. But with political turmoil back in Rome, Sulla had to rush back, leaving Lucius Licinius Murena in charge. This gave Mithridates a chance to regroup. The subsequent conflict, the Second Mithridatic War, saw Mithridates defeat the inexperienced Roman legions at the Battle of Halles. But the tides of war are ever-changing. The Third Mithridatic War began when Rome tried to annex Bithynia. Mithridates responded with a massive army. Initially, the Romans, under Lucullus, had the upper hand, pushing Mithridates into exile. But Mithridates made a comeback, decimating Roman legions at the Battle of Zella. However, his momentum was halted by Pompey at the Battle of the Lycus in 66 BC. Following this defeat, Mithridates fled to Caucasus and then to Crimea, planning yet another comeback. But not everyone was on board. His own son, Machars, refused to support him, leading Mithridates to have him killed. As he prepared for war, another son, Pharnaces II, rebelled against him, backed by Roman exiles. Cornered and defeated, Mithridates took his own life in the citadel of Panticopium. In a final nod to his legacy, Pompey had him buried in the ancestral tombs in Amasia, the ancient capital of Pontus. Even as Mithridates was waging wars and expanding his territories, danger lurked closer to home. 
During the First Mithridatic War, a conspiracy brewed within his inner circle. Four of his close associates, Minio and Philodemus from Smyrna, along with Cleisthenes and Asclepiodotus from Lesbos, hatched a plot to assassinate the king. But as with many conspiracies, loyalty can be fickle. Asclepiodotus, perhaps realizing the gravity of their plan or fearing its consequences, had a change of heart. He decided to turn informant. To convince Mithridates of the gravity of the threat, he set up a scenario where the king could hear the treacherous plot firsthand. Mithridates was concealed under a couch, listening as his supposed friends detailed their plans to end his life. Once the conspiracy was laid bare, Mithridates acted swiftly and ruthlessly. The traitors were subjected to torture before meeting their grim end. But Mithridates' retribution didn't stop with the conspirators. In a move to root out any lingering threats and to send a clear message about the cost of betrayal, he ordered the execution of not just the plotters, but also their families and friends. It was a brutal reminder of the dangers of crossing the powerful king of Pontus. Mithridates VI's relationship with Hellenism was strategic and deeply political. While his predecessors embraced Philhellenism, primarily to gain respect and prestige among the Hellenistic kingdoms, Mithridates VI wielded it as a potent political tool. His court was a melting pot, welcoming Greeks, Romans, and Asians alike. Positioning himself as the guardian of Greek cities against barbaric threats, especially those on the Black Sea and in Asia, Mithridates VI naturally evolved into the role of protector of Greece and its rich cultural heritage. This stance became particularly significant in his confrontations with Rome. For instance, when the city of Chersonesus faced threats from barbarians, they turned to Mithridates VI for protection, as noted by Strabo. His deep connection with Greece is evident in various symbols. One of the most striking is a heroine at Delos, dedicated to the Pontic king in 1021 BC by an Athenian priest. This dedication, along with another by a priest of Sarapis in 9493 BC, underscores Mithridates' significant influence and approval within Greek circles. The official coins of Pontus also reflect this cultural amalgamation, blending Greek styles with Persian elements. The figure of Perseus, often seen as a bridge between the East and West, was a popular motif. Drawing inspiration from Alexander the Great, Mithridates VI's propaganda evolved as tensions with the Roman Republic escalated. He portrayed himself not just as the defender of Greece, but as its great liberator. In this narrative, the Romans were cast as the barbarians, reminiscent of the Persians during the Greco-Persian Wars and Alexander's campaigns. While it's hard to gauge how many Greeks genuinely bought into this portrayal, it undeniably had its desired effect. Mithridates VI managed to wage the first war with Rome on Greek territory and secured Greek allegiance. This allegiance was further cemented when his Roman adversary, Sulla, allowed his troops to desecrate the sacred city of Delphi, looting its treasures to fund his military campaigns. Mithridates VI's end was as tumultuous as his life. As he planned to regroup and continue the war by invading Italy via the Danube, his harsh preparations led to discontent and rebellion among the local nobility and the general populace. In the face of this rebellion, Mithridates, known for his resistance to poisons due to his regular consumption of antidotes, attempted to end his life with poison. However, his immunity thwarted his attempt. Appian's account in Roman history paints a tragic scene. Two of his young daughters, betrothed to kings of Egypt and Cyprus, insisted on consuming the poison before him. They died immediately. But Mithridates, even after consuming the poison and trying to hasten its effects, remained unaffected. In his desperation, he turned to his Gallic bodyguard and friend, Betuidus, pleading with him to end his life. Betuidus, honoring the king's last wish, killed him. Cassius Dio's Roman history offers a slightly different narrative. After trying to poison his remaining family and himself, Mithridates, unable to die by his own hand due to his resistance to poison and weakened state, was eventually killed by those he had sent against his own son. They, seeing him linger, ended his life with their weapons. Both accounts highlight the tragic irony of Mithridates' end. A king who had fortified himself against poisons, who had faced numerous battles and challenges, found himself unable to control the circumstances of his own death. 
His life, marked by grand ambitions, political maneuverings, and battles against Rome, ended in a mix of tragedy and irony, making Mithridates the sixth a figure of both admiration and pity in the annals of history. Mithridates the sixth's life was marked by intrigue, warfare, and a peculiar obsession with poisons. After the assassination of his father, Mithridates V, a young Mithridates the sixth reportedly spent seven years in the wilderness, subjecting himself to various hardships. This period was transformative, shaping his resilience and sparking an interest in poisons. He embarked on a regimen of ingesting sublethal doses of various poisons, particularly arsenic, to develop immunity. This practice, known as Mithridatism or Mithridization, was rooted in his desire to protect himself from the same fate that befell his father. His commitment to understanding poisons didn't stop at self-experimentation. As king, he continued his studies, developing antidotes and testing their efficacy on condemned criminals. This practice wasn't unique to Mithridates. Attalus III of Pergamon had also engaged in similar studies. Mithridates' entourage included the Agari, Scythian shamans who oversaw his antitoxin routines. His security measures even extended to having animals guard him as he slept, ready to alert him of any approaching threats. His studies in poisons and antidotes were extensive, involving correspondence with renowned physicians of his time. His most famous concoction was the Mithridate or Mithridatium, a universal antidote he consumed daily. While the exact formula has been lost to history, various sources suggest it contained a myriad of ingredients, from Pontic Dep blood to walnuts and figs. The antidote's reputation grew, and after Mithridate's death, the Romans, particularly under Pompey, took interest in his medicinal library and specimens. The antidote's formula was translated, adapted, and prescribed under various names in Rome. Over the centuries, Mithridate's antidote underwent numerous transformations, with each physician adding or modifying ingredients. It became a staple in Western and Islamic medicine, evolving into a panacea believed to cure various ailments. Prominent historical figures, from Roman emperors to English monarchs, consumed versions of this antidote. However, its efficacy was debated. While some considered it a miracle cure, others, like the Chinese doctors of the Tang Dynasty or the Islamic scientist Averroes, were skeptical. By the 19th century, its popularity waned, and it was largely relegated to historical curiosity. Mithridates VI's legacy in the realm of toxicology is a testament to his relentless pursuit of knowledge and survival. His name remains synonymous with the practice of building immunity against poisons, a concept that continues to intrigue even today. Mithridates VI, the king of Pontus, was not only a formidable ruler, but also a man with a complex personal life. His lineage, a blend of Persian and Greek heritage, was reflected in the names he bestowed upon his children. His first marital union was with his sister, Laodice, a practice not uncommon in royal families of that era to preserve the purity of their bloodline. This union produced several children, sons Mithridates, Arcathius, Machars, and Pharnaces II, and daughters Cleopatra of Pontus and Dripatina. Dripatina, in particular, stood out due to her unique dental condition where her baby teeth never fell out, resulting in her having a double set of teeth. Mithridates' subsequent marriages were primarily with Greek women. His second wife, Monime, a Greek Macedonian noblewoman, bore him a daughter named Athenais. His third wife, Berenice of Chios, and his fourth wife, Stratonis of Pontus, were also of Greek origin. From these unions, he had another son, Zephyrs. His fifth wife remains a mystery, but his sixth wife was named Hypsocratia. In addition to his wives, Mithridates had several mistresses. One notable mistress was Adabojona the Elder, a Galatian Celtic princess. She bore him two children, Mithridates I of the Bosporus and Adabojona the Younger. Mithridates' numerous children from his concubines were named after the great kings of the Persian Empire, a nod to his claimed ancestry. His sons included Cyrus, Xerxes, Darius, Ariarathes IX of Cappadocia, Artaphernes, Oxithres, Phoenix, and Exipadrus. His daughters were Nyssa, Eupatra, Cleopatra the Younger, Mithridates, and Orsabaris. 
Two of his daughters, Nyssa and Mithridates, were even engaged to the Egyptian Greek pharaohs Ptolemy XII Alites and Ptolemy of Cyprus. However, the annexation of the kingdom of Pontus by the Roman general Pompey in 63 BC brought a tragic end to Mithridates' family. Many of his remaining family members, including sisters, wives, mistresses, and children in Pontus, faced execution. Some of them, including one of his sisters and five of his children, were paraded in Pompey's triumphal procession upon his return to Rome in 61 BC. Interestingly, Archelaus, a Cappadocian Greek nobleman and high priest of Camana, Cappadocia, claimed descent from Mithridates VI. While he professed to be a direct son, the timeline suggests he might have been a maternal grandson, possibly the offspring of one of Mithridates VI's daughters and a favored general. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the life of Mithridates VI, a ruler whose legacy is a testament to the intricate tapestry of history. His story, filled with ambition, intrigue, and personal complexities, reminds us of the ever-evolving nature of empires and the individuals who shape them. Thank you for watching this episode of History Uncovered. If you found this video informative and engaging, please like and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating stories from the past. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications so that you never miss a new video. Until next time, keep uncovering the stories that have shaped our world.